Well, thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. Give me just a second. I'll time myself because I want to keep time uh, at bay. Well, welcome. First of all, while you're listening to my introductory slides, please go and fill in the survey so that we could see the results here. Because I wonder what you think, what intelligence is, human or artificial? Um, when I was preparing these slides, I was trying to imagine all of you, my colleagues from computer science, my colleagues outside of computer science, my family. But then I was um, catching myself all the time on the idea that actually, when I really think about every slide, I think what my students might think about it. Um, my PhD students mainly, and I was thinking, why PhD students? Why am I so fixed? I actually have to think about someone, someone else specifically if I want to forget about my students uh, during the preparation. And, uh, well, and I realized that, well, because uh, it's a lecture about the future, a future that hasn't been written yet. So what kind of intelligence will we trust? I think the answer will ultimately be given by students, not necessarily my students, um, other students as well, so I'm dedicating this lecture to all PhD, MSc, BSc students in the audience. Uh, well, um, and I have broken the lecture into five simple parts. And the first one is about intelligence, and that's where I, I needed a bit of your input. Uh, so we could have a look. I, I put here, uh, this question is, which of the following sentences best describes human or robot as intelligent? Meaning that if you come home in the evening and say, I met such an intelligent person, <coughs> what would be the thing that you'll say? Because he is, or, or, or I saw such an intelligent robot, because. Um, and, um, well, I put a few things. Because that person can prove complex mathematical theorems or find and analyze all mistakes or can walk on uneven terrain, or can sustain casual conversation, or can recognize an image of a street sign, and so on. So actually, I put these items uh, with a view, because some of these items are particularly difficult for machines, and some are particularly difficult for people. Proving complex mathematical theorems is, is difficult for humans. Uh, maybe even solving Sudoku puzzles might be a little bit hard for us. That's why we call them puzzles. But for machines, sometimes it's swapped. Um, and so, for example, Sudoku puzzles, it's quite easy for a machine. So if we can look at this, uh, what we actually, the only big conclusion I thought we could all make is that actually there is very little consensus on what we think is intelligent for a human and for a machine. Um, and I think that's probably reflecting about what um, appreciation there is in society for what intelligent really means. So. Big conclusion from that is just that, that there is no real consensus. And I will switch to both panels. Well, um, in the absence of the consensus, I'd like to point out one thing. In the AI community, it will be very useful for us during the lecture. In the AI community, there is this consensus. There is what's called fast thinking and slow thinking. So this image of a dog here is a is an example of fast thinking, because when I show to you that image, you instantly can tell me what it is, even if it's very strange. You say, well, it's a dog with a guitar with some strange hair, but you can still recognize it. It takes you only a few seconds. For a machine, this kind of fast thinking is very difficult. If you give it to a neural network, it will have a hard time to recognize what actually is on the picture. On the right, though, is an example of slow thinking. If I ask you to multiply these two numbers, it will take you quite a bit to make the calculation. But if you put it to your calculator, you know, it will give you answer in a few seconds. So fast thinking and slow thinking. And of course, Sudoku puzzles is yet another example of slow thinking. It's very easy for a machine, and it might take you, I don't know, half an hour, an hour, maybe longer to, to solve it. So this is a little bit of a terminological consensus. Um, OK, so we don't have any consensus on what intelligence is. But actually, our history tells us that whenever someone worked out what human intelligence is, they were able to transform that knowledge into something that has to do with the machine and artificial intelligence. And I'll prove the point first with this very famous logician, mathematician, uh, George Bull. So, well, first of all, what do we know about George Bull? First of all, we know that it's probably the name that we pronounce most often of all the logicians and mathematicians. If you're a mathematician, you know about Boolean algebra. If you're a computer scientist, you know about the types of Booleans. And if you're an engineer, 
you know about Boolean circuits. So if, we, if someone just calculated how often we say bull, 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 bull around this campus, he would probably be the winner. Um, but we know other things about bull. He was a very humble person. He was a very curious person. And he was a Victorian. What it means to be a Victorian is to have a lot of faith in science. Victorians are the people who managed to take laws of nature and transform them into real engineering, right? The trains, the bridges, whatnot. And so Bull was very much from that time. He said, oh, well, let's think about it. If we can conquer laws of nature, maybe we can conquer laws of thought. Maybe our own thinking obeys some laws. And for example, you can actually come up with Boolean logic if you think of it hard enough. There are propositions. Propositions, for example, today is Tuesday. False or true? <laughs> false. And this is a lecture theater. False or true? True, they can be false or true. And then I can combine them in several ways, like bricks. For example, today is Tuesday and this is a lecture theater will also be a proposition and it will also be true or false. True or false? False. Okay, so Bull was interested how far you can go, how many laws you can get out of this thinking, how many different ways there are to combine our thoughts. If we forget about concrete proposition, but think about the proposition in general. For example, in general, for any propositions A and B, when A and B is true. And naturally enough, you can just draw it, a child can draw the table and say, well, A and B is true if both are true and I denoted by one, one. And in all other cases, A and B is false, because if just one of them is false, then the whole end sentence is false, as you intuitively told me already. And based on that, Bull said, well, and then let's formulate the laws. And this is one of the laws that you can formulate with this. For example, not A and B is equal to not A or not B. And you can say that whatever you plug in instead of A and B, it will always be true. Isn't it wonderful? Like the laws of mechanics, it's always true. And you can do something about it. And he was, of course, right. That's why we're still using Boolean connectives. It is the law, and you can still use Boolean logic in so many applications. Well, I wonder whether you can guess what's on the next picture. Anyone? It's some university campus. Who said, who said that? Could you raise your hand? Yes, so, excellent. It's University College Cork. It's where George Bull was a professor. But was he Irish? No, he wasn't Irish. He was English. But well, why George Bull wasn't then in Oxford or Cambridge, you may ask? Because he was a son of a shoemaker. He didn't have proper education. He taught himself mathematics and logic. So he was pretty much exiled to Ireland, to University College Cork. I'm saying all of this because I love Bull. Uh, I love Bull for so many reasons, but for one reason that I did my PhD on this campus as well. But also because this lecture, to a great extent, is about non-compliance, about people refusing to comply with the circumstances they're in. Well, he had a bad background, a son of a shoemaker, someone has the wrong nationality or gender, but we refuse to comply with this. We say we're going to do what we think is right. So remember, that's the second thought, this lecture about non-compliance. Um, so when I came to the University College Cork, a few years after Boone, um, I came to work with my PhD supervisor, Tony Seda. Tony was a topologist, actually. He was not a logician at all. But uh, he had a PhD student, Pascal Hitzler, from Germany, who told him, Listen, there is this problem in logic. If you take logic, convert it to neural networks, you get infinite neural networks. And then you can approximate neural networks with finite neural networks. And that's where we need topology. So Tony was looking for a logician, and I was a logician. I came, uh, and I started to work on a, on a thesis with Tony. I, to explain to you exactly how Tony approximated infinite neural networks and why is a long story. But I can explain it very easily by going a little bit backwards and explaining to you the origin of the ideas on which Tony and his student mm -hmm. were working. We have to go back to Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts with their work, A Logical Calculus of Ideas Immanent in Nervous Activity. So as you can see, 1943, about 100 years after 
George Bull's um, laws of thought. Well, what they were interested in, oh, and on the left here is Walter Pitts, and on the right is Walt, uh, Warren McCulloch. So uh, Warren McCulloch was a neuroscientist, and uh, Walter Pitts was the logician in this, um, in this photo. So the ideas uh, are this. Um, of course, uh, McCulloch knew about neurons at that time in 1943. And the basic information about the neuron that you could know is that we know that neuron is sort of like a function. It gets inputs here from um, dendrites, and then it propagates the signals through the axon. So it's like a signal propagator, like a function. And also, they knew already then about neurons that uh, these uh, signals, they kind of depend. You can excite the neuron several times, and if you excite it often enough, it becomes more sensitive to signals. So it kind of, it, and that's how we learn, right? So that's how we learn not to touch hot things because we stop doing it, or, or we could be reinforced doing something by getting positive signals. And so they just transform this um, into this nice abstract picture saying, well, suppose you get some inputs, three, four, five, doesn't matter. This is like your dendrites, and then the output is like your axon. And um, the only thing you need to add to this is how you change something in this picture. And well, you think that you're multiplying each of the inputs by some number, which is called the weight. And then if your output is not what you like, you go back and you change the weights here. And then again, you multiply the inputs, sum them up, and you get your output. Um, well, as a matter of experiment, let's uh, transform Boolean connective AND into a little neuron. Uh, well, AND, as you can remember, as a function, uh, was depending on two variables, A and B. I multiply each of them by some weight, sum them up, and then I get some result. Uh, well, usually I would initialize these weights randomly, so I would gonna get just random output, but because it's all about neurons, I'm gonna excite this neuron with the correct inputs and outputs, and I'm gonna make sure that it's, it's learning from this table of data until it's good enough. And um, I'll show you a quick demo Hopefully. So here's a random initialization of weights for the Boolean end connective. And then this little neuron starts learning something. So little by little, it adjusts its weights until it converges to the situation when whenever I plug in one and one for A and B, I get one as an output. So this is what happens when people run neural networks, but on a big scale. So there is a, this adaptation of a neuron to the signal given by Boolean connectives. So hopefully it stops. Um, as you can see, <laughs> numbers still look pretty random. But uh, point here, they are exactly big enough so that if I put one instead of B and A, multiply these two numbers by one, sum them up, they will be able to pass this threshold. So that's exactly what we need out of this neuron. All right. So um, Pitts is another very non-compliant person. And remember, this is the lecture about non-compliance. Pitts was born in Detroit in a very uneducated poor family. He had to teach himself mathematics and logic. And the way he did it is by reading Principia Mathematica by Russell, who was in which university? Cambridge. Cambridge. Very good. <laughs> So imagine a boy in Detroit sitting and reading Principia Mathematica and are you mad? He even wrote some questions to Russell to Cambridge and Russell invited him to study in Cambridge. But Pitts didn't go there. But he was very much influenced by Principia Mathematica, which was a big book, four volumes, trying to teach everyone how to do mathematics in general. So that was one influence. And who can guess who is on the right? Leibniz. Leibniz was another influence of uh, Pitts because he saw that Leibniz was thinking about nervous system as a universal computing machine and kind of combining the ideas of um, Russell that everyone, everything could be a logical calculus and the ideas that actually nervous system could be a calculus. You get what we've just seen, um, a notion of a neuron as a Boolean connective or trained Boolean connective. Well, Pitts, of course, knew about Alan Turing with his universal Turing machine. And what he was up uh, for is neural networks as universal computing machines. And uh, 
well, let's leave that part of the history to itself. One way or another, in 2007, I finished my PhD. And you see a photo of my PhD thesis on, on one side. And um, another thing that I got through completing my PhD, through Tony, my supervisor, I got included in this mathematics genealogy project, which traces your ancestors on PhD. So Tony is my father by PhD. His PhD supervisor is my grandfather, and so on and so on. So um, of course, I included uh, the picture of Leibniz, not for anything, but because Leibniz is my grand-grand-grandfather. Somehow, I always was more proud of this as an achievement of my PhD, this, you know, this new relative, Leibniz, uh, even more than my PhD thesis. I don't know why. It's, uh, it's my personal weakness, I suppose. Before I finish with my PhD years, uh, I should mention John Power, who influenced me immensely. Uh, he is a prominent category theorist who, at that time, was working in Edinburgh. So he has many contributions to semantics of programming languages. Thanks to John, I had now have rather a uh, huge appreciation for program language semantics. And thanks to John, I came to Edinburgh because we had a joint project between my supervisor and him, and we could visit. And so I also owe John my acquaintance with Scotland. And oh well, on top of famous paper by Plotkin and Power, I'll put also our publication. You can see here, I already moved to INRI after my PhD, and he moved to Bath. But actually, that paper was written in Edinburgh during my PhD time. OK, let's say goodbye to my PhD years and to this introduction to artificial intelligence and think what, what we can take away from this. And my takeaway, my suggested takeaway, is that logic and artificial intelligence were born together. Um, George Bull was thinking about laws of thought. Pitts was thinking about neurons that can think. And so they were born together. And in my opinion, logic and AI share some DNA still. And this is my favorite section. This is about trust. Well, how can we trust? How can we trust mathematical results? Because mathematicians make mistakes. We know that. And how can we trust computer calculations? Because programs may contain bugs. And I won't continue. How can we trust our own relatives and our government and so on? I'll stop here. Well, that's a problem, yeah? How can we? So Russell, who already we saw in the pictures, we saw his proud face. Um, is an author of Russell's Paradox. He wasn't the first uh, person who noticed that there are paradoxes in mathematics, but he is one of the better known names. So let us look at the Russell's Paradox, which exactly questions who can we trust, what can we trust. It's very easy, that's why I included it. We can cover it in one blackboard. Suppose we take a set R. Well, it's a set of all sets that are not subsets of themselves. In mathematical notation, it's a set of all such x that x is not an x. Who knows why? But if you're a mathematician, it does make sense maybe to take this. Maybe not. But the question is this. What can we say about this set R? Is R itself in R? OK. And here's the theorem that uh, we know holds. R is in R, if and only if R is not in R. <laughs> Actually, we think it's, it's very nonsensical, but it's very easy proof. So let's have a look at it. So that's the definition of a set R, right? So suppose R is in R, but then it should satisfy this property that R is not in R. Or suppose it's not in R, but then it's part of X, and so it's, it's in R. So just by playing with this definition of R, you get that it's in R is in R whenever it's not in R. Um, I don't know what you all um, take of it, but um, Russell and other mathematicians, logicians, were quite upset about it. <laughs> um, you may think it's a, some kind of game that I included in my inaugural lecture just to entertain you. They were upset about it because what it shows you is that you can use valid mathematical language valid mathematical theory and still get a nonsense. 
Well, it's good that this nonsense is very easily identifiable, but what if uh, it's a, a nonsense that it's hard to spot? Then, you know, you have a little bug in your mathematical theory, little bug, and then the whole of your mathematical theory is a bug. So that was very upsetting. And um, the way out of it is very intuitive and probably what you're thinking. If you ask yourself, is it, can you imagine this setup? Can you actually construct it? Is it intuitive definition of R? You'd probably say, not really. Moreover, if I wanted to do another survey and in three hours time I send you all an email and say, can you recollect Russell's paradox? Can you tell it to your friend or relatives? You probably wouldn't be able to even reconstruct this argument. So unintuitive it is. And so the answer was that let's not do unintuitive things in mathematics. But that's hard. How do you say? For me it's intuitive, for you it's not intuitive, so that's not a <coughs> recipe. And then how about not intuitive are those which we can't construct. So if someone could tell me, construct a set of all odd numbers. I say it's one and three and five, I can construct it. But if I can't construct something, then it means unintuitive and potentially a source of bugs. So let's take this idea about being intuitive or not. Anyway, this was very upsetting. This was a big thing, very big thing. And Russell said, Oh, I know the solution. Oh, someone was drawing on my blackboard. It's like in real life. You come to a lecture theater and someone drew something. Uh, I'll work around it, don't worry. Russell said, let's define types because they can help. And Russell's type theory is very easy. It says, let's take type of individuals like integers, for example. Think of I as integers, but it could be any individuals. Type of propositions all, think about bool whenever you hear the word proposition. Um, and also, let's, let us be allowed to put these types um, into lists like this. And that's all. And for example, predicate P applied to T1, Tn is well typed if P is of type uh, list of T1, Tn, and each Ti is of type big Ti. We think, what is this P, what is this TI example? Instead of P, take the predicate greater than. Instead of T1 and T2, take 5 and 3. And then greater than, because greater than is now my P. Greater than has type integer, integer. Well, least integer, comma, integer. Pair, if you like, in this case. And 3 and 5, each have type integer. And so this is how I type greater than 5, 3 in Russell's type theory. Is that okay? Okay. Well, <coughs> the trouble with Russell's paradox was self-reference. So, and that's why Russell suggested this type theory. Try, instead of having some T1, Tn inside of P, try putting P itself um, as, a, as an argument of this predicate. And so let's try to type this outer P. Outer P, by this definition, should be of type list of one element T. But inner P should be of type T without brackets, without the list construction. And so P is this one and this one. So if you actually had type theory in your language, uh, you wouldn't be able to get any consistent type. And so you'd be prevented from having P applied to P in your language. And so you'll be prevented from Russell's paradox. Witty. I think it's witty. I think I, I like it, actually. Well done, Russell. Um, well, if it was only Russell. No, it wasn't just Russell. It was a century-long quest for trust, a century of work which put trust in the center of people's lives. Um, well, it started in 1907 with intuitionism. Brouwer, Heiting, Kolmogorov said that to prove an object exists is to construct it. Well, this is very much along the lines of what we just discussed. Don't trust anything you cannot actually construct with your own hands or with your own algorithms later on when people had computers. Then Russell, of course, assigning types to objects helps to avoid paradoxes. Uh, who can guess 1934? Have some logicians in the room. Natural deduction, Gensen, proofs that can be constructed automatically. Okay, so 
these people here just say, well, think about construction anytime you want to prove. And this one says, by the way, you can do it automatically without the human in principle by an algorithm. Um, then in 1940, uh, type lambda terms, George, Cardi, um, they taught us how to assign a type to a function. That's important because computer science is about functions, so it kind of you brings uh, types back from logic to functions. And by the way, since uh, this is for the first time when the pictures jumped uh, across the ocean, so Kolmogorov is Russian, um, Brower Heiting Dutch, uh, Russell English, Gensen German, and uh, these two gentlemen, George and Cardi, are American. So um, I think it's, uh, it's helpful to say it was not just century-long uh, quest for trust, but international quest for trust. Uh, even across the ocean, uh, this, uh, this got propagated. 1969, the audience is very welcome to shout. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, proposition is types. So uh, this work united the two ideas, how to give types and, and how to give types to functions. So um, our proofs, um, propositions as uh, types and proofs as functions. Um, next. I'm looking at some person. <laughs> Dependent types, the gen. Types depend on objects uh, it describes. So now, after that, what happens is types become more and more complex, and I will go and go faster, because if you're not type theorist, I'm not going to give you enough of information to understand the details. But basically, since then, people started to put more and more information inside of the type. Why would you want your type to be very rich and, uh, and fancy? Because you may want to uh, express more mathematics with those types. So OK, uh, Netherlands, 1970, 1984. Martin Löw, um, who's, who told us about inductive types, that's a constructive view on infinite sets, and infinite sets important for mathematics, and that is Sweden. It's like Eurovision now, actually. It's <laughs> 10 points to Sweden. Um, now, uh, then 1986, Girard, with higher order types, and this is 10 points go to France. Very well. Um, the other two, uh, the final two pictures you may probably again guess, Kakang and Huet, incorporating all these ideas into one system, calculus of inductive constructions. And those two gentlemen are from France again. Okay, so um, after that, basically, of course, the, it's, it's all still ongoing and it hasn't finished in 1988 and people do more interesting stuff. But basically, the, the building was built, and then you had to put lots of interesting things inside of it, and maybe also outside. From about 1990s until now, there is a serious work on provers and languages based on rich types, based on all of these ideas. And I mentioned only a few. They are not the only ones. But Koch, Koch because the author was Kokang. Um, then Agda, because Agda is a chicken in Swedish, and Kakang moved to Sweden. <laughs> and Haskell is one that is not really fitting into the broad uh, story. It's because, uh, well, there was uh, Haskell Curry it's, uh, for him. So Haskell is actually slightly in a different uh, line of research. But basically, they're all here. Uh, an important thing I want to mention is that somehow in the middle of this line, People stopped asking just how can we trust mathematics or mathematicians. They also, because about the time when De Bruyne was working on automath, people realized that very soon computers are going to be able to do it. And then they, and, and remember, this, these, these people, they're all about trust. They're crazy about trust. And when, as soon as they realized computers soon will be able to do it, they immediately asked, and how can we trust computers that do our beautiful mathematics? And they came up with a very witty decision. They said, as our programs start growing and our compilers start growing, surely they will have bugs. We know, because we can't trust anyone. But if we have a small core to our languages, a small type checker that can check the types, you know, maybe it's going to be very big, but at the end, once you found the proof, you can type check it with a small core, then you can trust your programs. So um, I think that's important to mention. The trust, this community works both on the trust 
in mathematics and trust in computers. Because that second idea would be particularly important for us. Um, well, I knew about the theory of this, but my first acquaintance with this community actually hand shoulder to shoulder uh, working with them was when I came for my postdoctoral studies after PhD to Indria. So this nice picture there is Indria Sophia Antipolis near Antib. Very nice, beautiful place. And uh, my supervisor for postdoctoral time was Yves Berthaud. He was one of the authors of the, one of the first books uh, on Koch theory improver. And so that's where I actually had a chance to immerse myself completely into this constructive logic community. Still very grateful for those, for those years. In 2008, one year after my PhD, we had the first paper with Eve. So um, I want to finish this uh, section uh, about trust with just telling you what this community is proud of. How intelligent, since it's about intelligence, are these modern provers. Well, now these languages, this 100th century quest for trust actually resulted in languages that are expressive enough to verify large areas of mathematics, safety properties of software and hardware. And I'm just listing a few um, high peaks that they conquered. Um, they applied in formal mathematical proofs for color theorem, Kepler's conjecture, Faye-Thompson theorem, and also applied in industrial proofs in a bunch of on verification of a bunch of compilers and microprocessors. And the work is still ongoing. So this is actually, I just wanted to have the slides tell you, that's actually real stuff. It's not just theoretical stuff. It it's actually works on real problems. So takeaway number three for all of us. If you have trust issues in life, you should know that type theorists got it. <laughs> I mean, really got it. Um, and this is good to at least someone got it, right? And part four is about trust in AI. That's where things get messy, but that's what we're interested in. Um, so we should start with the Big Bang. Um, and Big Bang happened in the hundred years between George Bull and Pitts. That was the Big Bang during which everything in computer science was born. Right, because you take laws of thought and then you take perceptron. And that's about all you need to know about modern computer science. <laughs> um, so on the top of this, as already mentioned, was the trust line. I call it the trust line. Uh, as some other people call it type theory. Um, there was another line of uh, development there. And it is called automated reasoning. But we'll give it a different name will give it a name, make the slow thinking great again. <laughs> it's again, because calculators went out of fashion. No one says, you didn't say that calculator would be an intelligent tool. But Sudoku puzzle, some of you thought might be intelligent. So it's about this, make very clever calculators that could do puzzles and could, uh, could reason about very complex software automatically, like calculators. That's an important part here. So they're very good if you have lots of different cases in the proof and then they can all be discharged, they're kind of routine. So SMT solvers, model checkers, AI planners, lots of stuff there. And immensely successful field, immensely successful. And finally, machine learning, which I give a, a different name. Do the fast thinking by any means, any means you can. And because by any means, this, uh, this line, of course, got um, immersed in other fields of mathematics, like probability, statistics, linear algebra. So this is definitely not many in computer science would not even call it logic any longer. So far it went from logic. So we got from these deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, etc. So, um, and many people would call AI this bottom branch, which I disagree with, but often when people say AI, they really mean machine learning, which I think is a misnomer that shouldn't be said like this. But let's talk a little bit about machine learning in the modern sense, not in the sense of McCulloch and Pitts. Well, people said, ah, let's, for example, make neural networks recognize images. Suppose I have a data set of uh, written digits, 
handwritten digits, and I compose a big neural network. By the way, each of these neurons, think about Pitts, McCulloch and Pitts neuron, because each of them are just like McCulloch and Pitts neuron, except for they're composed together. And let's let make this neural network learn what handwritten digits are, zero and one and two. And because computers became more and more powerful in the 90s and 2000s, people could construct huge neural networks. And the huger the neural networks, the more it can recognize. So for example, for the data set of handwritten digits, it has several thousand images. You can get 99% accuracy for the neural network. And in the 90s, people thought, oh my god, you give 50,000 images to this thing, and with 99% probability, it tells you which digit it is. Surely, in some mysterious way, that thing understands what a handwritten digit is, right? If you don't understand what a digit is, how can you be so accurate? So surely, there's some mysterious way in which the neural network understands the idea of a digit. And everyone was so excited about this. They thought, we can do everything with machine learning. Until 2013 and 14, when this paper came out, 13, 14, because it first appeared on archive and then it was published. So there were researchers from Google, Facebook, um, and a couple of other universities, for, other, for a couple of universities, that published this paper, which basically told this. Suppose you have your great neural network that's 99% accurate on all handwritten digits that you gave it. And it was 99% of confidence, 99% confidence it says it's the zero. And then I perturb this zero with some noise. And the deal is with this perturbation that it should be so small that the human would not notice. And so what you see on the right is the result of applying some pixel perturbation to my original image. And then suddenly, it still looks as zero as, as this one, these two zeros look equally zero to me. But suddenly, neural network says, now I predict that this is a five, and my confidence in this is 92%. Um, so this was shocking, actually. It's like Russell paradox, but for machine learning. Well, first of all, people think, first of all, it means that it's unsafe. Anyone could just hack into my, my system and make, uh, make it, uh, um, and, and the decisions will be all wrong in the system. But worse than that, it actually says, no, your neural network didn't know anything about the idea of a digit. It simply was fine-tuned for your 50,000 images, and that's all. So there is no magic in the neural network. It didn't learn any idea by being 99% uh, accurate. Um, well, is, is this a problem? It is a problem, because by the time people realized that the, the whole machine was already in to get neural networks everywhere, so they are part of many complex systems, and in particular, they are part of uh, autonomous cars. And they're not really intelligent, and they're not really trustworthy. So that's a problem. Uh, how big is the problem? Where would you be expecting to find a neural network? First of all, with any data. So any social media that processes data of users, they use neural networks to do it. Secondly, any chatbots that you find, so if you're chatting to some robot in your bank application, that would be machine learning, most likely. Smart homes, so if you have some system that measures different things in your home, uh, very likely we'll be using some sort of machine learning. And now I'm going to some kind of futuristic thing. So this is an actual robot nurse in Italy. So if someone devises something like this, this should have some sort of computer vision inside of it, at least. And maybe some machine learning recognizes uh, as well speech. Of course, in autonomous cars, some of them are already on the roads, and maybe in the future in any fancy robot. But this is, this is very futuristic, so this is not a real robot. But anyway, you, you get my point. So these unsafe things uh, that don't really know what they're learning are in many, in many applications. So the situation is we have on the top people who know everything about trust, uh, and we have at the bottom people who have a lot of power. Um, and, and here you are. So trustworthy AI is commonly called the biggest scientific challenge of our days. It is called so because after the Big Bang, these two branches flew away so far apart that actually researchers who are working on the top and on the bottom very rarely speak to each other. 
the, the methodology, the language is different. It's like two universes. And so that's our fourth takeaway. The gulf of trustworthy AI, the gulf between trust and AI, looks unassailable for many. But this is a lecture about non-compliance. It's a lecture about non-compliance. So if for many this looks unassailable, of course, we will open a research lab that will try to bridge the gap. Um, it is a lecture about non-compliance, so we opened a research lab, uh, called it Lab for AI and Verification, launched it in 2019, and we wanted to accumulate local expertise in logic, AI, programming languages, verification, um, and in, in the future, respond to any trust demands of Edinburgh Robotarium, Edinburgh Center for Robotics. So there are many members, these are only those members who actually gave me their pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of them are in the audience, which I'm, I'm very happy about. Uh, we have many members, some of them only do machine learning, some only logic, uh, some do both. So, uh, you know, you probably notice your face here. Um, so I want, I want to tell you now in the last 10 minutes of this lecture what we do. And, uh, in order to explain you what we do, we need to understand this. So what is the complex intelligent system? So imagine yourself in semi-autonomous car and you drive and you give instructions to the car. So first of all, the car has this computer vision, like this digit recognition that we saw. Then it has speech recognition, some signal processing to understand what you tell it to do. Turn left, turn right. It has some planning in order to find the road in the city. And it has chatbots, uh, chatbot kind of technology when it tries to process what kind of language sentences it, it can construct. Roughly speaking, these things could be divided into two big domains, uh, perception tasks and like computer vision or signal processing and reasoning tasks like planning and logic reasoning on top of planning. Um, and so some of people in the lab for AI and verification just look in isolation and perception tasks or reasoning tasks, which is in itself very interesting. Just to have the separation, I'm working on perception, I'm working on reasoning. And I will use red colors uh, whenever I have a PhD student in the list of authors, because uh, I want to emphasize which work was done by PhD students. Um, so we do both of these domains. But that's not what we're famous for. That's not what we're most proud of. Mainly the lab aims to conquer the gulf of trustworthy AI. Um, and the way to explain to you how we try to conquer that gulf is maybe to bring back the idea of Maslow pyramid, a very old idea. Hopefully you all know about it. What Maslow said that not all needs of a human are equal. You cannot just say that they're all equal. They actually, one is subordinate to another. You have lower level needs, like physiological needs. Only if this is satisfied, you can go a layer up for safety needs. Only once you're physiologically okay and, and safe, you can think about love. And once that is satisfied, you go for esteem and self-actualization. So that was Maslow's idea. We take this as an analogy and say, how about we think about complex intelligence systems in the same way? They're not on the left perception, on the right reasoning, no. They're subordinate to one to another. So perception goes at the bottom layer, we do need perception. On top of it comes reasoning, and on top of it comes verification. So basically, in terms of the domain, scientific domains, it's about machine learning, automated reasoning, and types. Um, so let me try to explain to you. First of all, because we know a little bit of constructive logic, we don't trust any idea just for the sake of it. So we don't trust the pyramid until we actually go and try every brick. So I'm going to show you how we tested this pyramidal structure with, with our little hammers. Uh, firstly, let's talk about chatbots. Let's just try this, this, this pyramid idea works. Perceive, perception, perceive layer, you perceive speech as signals. You can reason on top of it, find meaningful response, but on top of it, you wanna put 
the verify block, you verify that the chatbot will not insult or mislead the user. So we have a student here in this audience, Marco, who works exactly on these problems, how to put this verification block on top of the chatbot. Let's uh, try something else. How about computer vision? Well, you perceive camera, radar, LiDAR signals. You reason about maybe optimal classification of this. And then you verify that the network is robust, for example, to adversarial perturbations that I showed you, to small changes in the input will not change the, the output of the network. And so here again, we have some people working on this. So um, these two examples that I showed you, as a matter of fact, don't trace the whole pyramid. They were all going from perception to verification stages, and they were not yet touching the trust. And this is the hardest block, because that's the farthest, that's the, our trust line. So we are very excited about exploring this. To tell you how excited we are, it's like, imagine you're an ancient Egyptian, and you're told, man, you're the first person to complete a full pyramid with the top on it. And you, I'm proud, I'm the first person in the civilization to be able to build the full pyramid. So that's how we feel. I'll tell you, we succeeded twice. Uh, and I'll tell you how we succeeded. So we definitely want to remember about the trust line, and we want to remember our pyramid. And then we have a few principles that we take. We do not want to create a parallel trust line for AI, because it will take us a century, and we don't have that much time. We want to join this line just when it ends. It ends with high assurance programming languages, and that's what we want to take out of the trust line. We also want to learn one lesson from trust line. Extend trust only to small core checker at the top of the pyramid. Don't try to verify absolutely everything at the bottom. But then strive to make this small trust controlling block uh, as intelligent as you can. So we succeeded once, and I'll give it as an example. Suppose you wanted to define a complex system that schedules um, cars in New York. Uh, you want to perceive raw data of journey routes and durations. You want to reason, plan ahead and find optimal allocation of passengers and drivers through AI planners. And on top, you want to use types to ensure trust. For example, guarantee correctness of plans produced on this level. Um, control fuel consumption, fairness of allocations, or maybe compliance with the law. For example, maybe I can't give certain driver more than 12 hours of work a day. And uh, this was the first time when we really succeeded to put types on the top of the pyramid. And this was done in Agda. Remember one of those uh, broad languages from Thierry Kakan. And on, on underneath it was using one of those make slow thinking great again languages, PDDL, AI planner. Um, so now it is a PhD thesis of Alice the Hill that it exactly these days are being submitted, and a few research papers there. And at the start, there were more PhD students even working on it. Um, we didn't fully succeed with the pyramid yet with that, because uh, Alastair's thesis did not include perception. And the reason we didn't just didn't have time. Um, so the way to put perception in here is to actually take neural nets. Uh, we perceive raw data, pixels and measurements. We analyze structure of the neural net and check if it satisfies verification properties, for example, robustness to attacks. And on top of it, we use types to ensure trust, ensure validity of the property languages in which we, uh, we formulated the uh, verification properties, correctness and safety of machine learning and verification interfaces. Um, and we've done this with Haskell Agda at the top, one of those trustworthy languages. So, Language Vehicle has many authors. Um, Matthew Daggett, Wem Koke, Bob Atke, these two researchers are from Strathclyde, Matthew from Headed Watt, Luca, Arnaboldi from Edinburgh, Natalia, Marco, Aina, Remy, all students here in Headed Watt. What I want to say about this picture is, is just one message. It looks all fun and trust and not trust and, and pyramid, but actually if you want to build this system, it's quite a big system. 
uh, there's an engineering effort, right? So it has some of uh, machine learning here for Python, uh, TensorFlow, and uh, you have networks here. You have neural network verifiers to make slow thinking great again tools. Um, you, have, you have other components that hold this all together. And then in the middle of it, you have this type checker, the language vehicle that will make sure that all of the system works as a, as a clock and can be trusted. And so this is written in Haskell. And this is all I really wanted to say. The pyramid method really helps us to break down the complex AI systems into blocks and incorporate trust in them. And we have just started our journey across the gulf of trustworthy AI. I just want to conclude with a few remarks. So if you need to remember, maybe this one slide that you need to remember after this lecture. Logic and computer science are at the end of an amazing century of discovery that gave rise to modern trustworthy programming languages based on types. There is terminolo terminological and possibly political confusion in calling machine learning intelligent. It's not. But complex intelligent systems with machine learning components are here to stay because we need perception layer in complex systems. We cannot run away from that. The quest for trust in these complex systems is indeed major intellectual, technological, and societal challenge. The gulf of trustworthy AI is indeed wide and challenging, but not unassailable. We simply need to stretch further towards the legacy and modern technology of the trust line. And if you believe this message, <laughs> immediately join live as a student member, collaborator, or friend, and board the ship and we'll uh, try to conquer the Gulf. I want to finish uh, this lecture with a citation from Great Gatsby, because it's a novel about a person who refused to comply with circumstances. Um, and this is a lecture about non-compliance, right? So tomorrow, we will run faster, stretch our arms farther, and one fine morning. So, well, we beat on, boats against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past. Thank you. <laughs>